Hello and welcome everybody to Introduction to Deep Learning. Um, today we're going to continue with training and optimizing neural networks. Um, specifically, we are going to talk about the methods that we need to choose in order to find the optimal parameters given a certain training set. So if we're doing a very quick recap what we had done in the previous lecture or lectures, uh, we now know the structures of neural networks, right? So we have these concept of layers, we have input layers, hidden layers, output layers, we have the neurons that connect these layers. Um, and we have made the analogy from compute graphs and neural networks, where we can now um, split up all of these computations in the layers of the neural networks into nodes of compute graphs. And as part of that, um, we can compute derivatives using backpropagation accordingly. More specifically, the idea behind using the compute graphs is that we have the chain rule in order to compute the respective partial derivatives. And then we have a loss function, and then we essentially can differentiate through the loss function and all the layers of our neural network. Um, and then at the end of the day, um, we can compute gradients with respect to all the weights W and all the biases B in our neural networks. So what we have now is essentially we have um, a set of unknown parameters, which is the neural network weights and the biases. We have a set of constraints that is given by our training set. Um, and we want to um, apply a certain optimization, which is based on gradients, such that we're finding the optimal parameters in order to fit this function, in order to fit this neural network to the training set. Also, as a quick reminder here, um, it's always, again, it's always the same thing in machine learning. What we're doing is we have a training set, and from this training set, we would like to we would like to approximate the training set by fitting the neural network to it. And the neural network is essentially a pretty powerful function that can, in principle, approximate the distribution of that. And the way we're doing it is this optimization here. Okay, so if we're summarizing what we have here right now, so we have these directional compute graphs, uh, we have the structure and layers, so we can compute it very efficiently in a forward and a backward pass. In the backward pass, we're getting the partial derivatives with respect to the unknowns here. Um, and what we had in the previous lecture was essentially we have this gradient vector. And um, again, what was very important here is note these indices here. We have L, M and N, which is which layer, which neuron layer and which input um, that goes into the respective neuron for that specific neuron in that specific layer. And the idea here is um, that we can compute these gradients. Um, now we have the gradients. Now what we want to do is we want to do a certain optimization based on these gradients. And the way we're going to do this is gradient descent. Of course, it's not that straightforward. Um, like everything with neural networks, we have to think about how we use that. And based on the title of the lecture, which is called scaling optimization, uh, we will see that we have to do a couple of things to actually make this practical and tractable. Now, in the optimization, um, everything we're going to do is gradient based uh, and everything is going to be some variation of gradient descent. So the idea of gradient descent is we have this function f here, which is our neural network, x is our unknowns, in this case would be the weights and the biases. Uh, and we would like to find the optimal parameters or the optimal values x prime of that function that minimize the function itself, right? So if we're saying, oh, hey, we have this initialization here, we would like to reach the minimum here, this global optimum, of that function. And note that we have local and global minima. So these ones here are local minima. Um, and this one here is the global minima, of course. Now, how do we find the gradients? Well, um, if we go into the derivatives, uh, we talked about this one already a little bit. Um, we can basically do a differentiation. Um, and the way you do this is um, you can here uh, do forward differentiation, right? Um, you simply have, uh, you compute the gradients, you make an infinitesimally small step h um, to figure out the the variant the variance of the function here um, you let uh, you let h go to zero and that gives you the respective partial derivatives and then the idea is basically then we are following what we want to do is so we want to follow the slope of the derivative right so we would like to go ahead um, and go um, go into the the negative direction um, of the gradient uh, in order to find the minimum. 
right? So the idea is whenever I, I make the function value smaller, which is the slope of the function essentially, right? Um, then eventually if I continue that, I will find eventually the minimum of the function, which I would like to do. Nothing new, pretty straightforward. Now, the idea is of course, um, in our context, um, that the gradient is, uh, could be also multidimensional, right? Um, so we might have multiple partial derivatives. In practice, we do have that. This is all the parameters of our neural network. We have to compute all of these ones. Um, and then we are applying our, and based on that, we are applying our update steps. So we say we have an initial set of X. Um, we, we have a certain step size that we're going down here. Um, and we have the gradient of the function X, right? Uh, of F of X. Um, and now the question is, um, what we want to do is we want to go the direction of the greatest increase uh, of the function. This, sorry, we want to go in the negative greatest increase of the function in the step size. This is what the gradients are about. Uh, and one big question here we have to address is basically how big should these step size be? Um, and the step size in machine learning land or in deep learning land are called learning rates because this is how fast we are training. But this is just the step size of our, our gradient. Now, if we're having a small step size um, and a small learning rate, this alpha here, if this is very small, uh, then we need a lot of steps to go down there. Uh, if we have a very large learning rate, then we're going to do larger steps and we go faster down. And as we will see, um, it's actually quite tricky to choose a good learning rate. In fact, probably out of all the machine learning stuff, like choosing learning rate is one of the most difficult ways to have hyperparameters. And we will dedicate pretty much, well, half a lecture or so later on how we're choosing the respective learning rates in order to get good results. Um, I'm going to defer this right now. Um, I first wanted to go over the, the big picture overview of how we use gradient descent in machine learning, uh, in deep learning, and how we actually do this in practice. Uh, and there's a few more considerations. So, um, okay, learning rate we have talked about. This is critical and important. Um, but there's also things, um, the question is basically, well, what is the gradient when we reach a minimum? Well, we do know that, right? When we going and finding a minimum here, um, this is a local minimum. Um, and in this local minimum, we have no gradient anymore. And assuming we have found this local minimum, um, then we would not do any updates anymore because our gradient would just be zero and we would quote unquote be stuck there. Um, so the big challenge is essentially with all kind of gradient descent solvers that we are not guaranteed to reach the global optimum. And this is very, very important to understand. Uh, even though we're going to talk about a lot of variations right now of gradient descent and how to apply it specifically for neural networks, we will see that it never is guaranteed to reach the global optimum. What we can guarantee under certain conditions is we can find a local optimum and we can guarantee under certain set of conditions that we can find uh, a convergence of the function but we can never guarantee that it is a global optimum the only time when we can guarantee that it's a global optimum is if we do have a convex function in this case all, mi all local minima are also global minima uh, the definition of and you're going to hear this if you're taking like an optimization lecture um, a, a lot more. Um, the definition of, of, of a uh, convex function is if a line or plane segment between any two points lies above or on the respective graph of the function, right? Um, so in other words, if we are having this function f of x here and we like having uh, any arbitrary plane or line here, um, this is above or on the graph of the function, right? So we have not more than two intersections here. Um, and this is critical to understand because if we're talking about neural networks, neural networks by design choice, the way we design them are actually never convex. And in fact, they are highly non-convex, meaning that we have many, many, many different local minima. Um, and there's no practical way to ever say which one is the global optima, right? We just don't know it. Like this is something you can never figure out with a neural network. The only thing you can do, you can go ahead and train your network. You can observe your loss functions. You can see how far it goes down. And that value gives you an indication essentially um, how well or how good your optima is at the end of the day. And what you could do, for instance, you could try different initializations. 
We'll talk about this also a little bit later, like what are good initializations for our uh, unknowns, for our network parameters. Um, in this case, we, we can choose different initializations and presumably if we have different initializations, we also going to reach different uh, local optima and probably also get different results. Um, this depends a little bit on the context and we're going to talk about this a little bit more. Um, I can already say one spoiler alert here is neural networks, the way they work in practice is they are in practice so large and so high dimensional that the performance, meaning how well we can fit this network to the respective training set, um, there's typically many local minima that actually give a good approximation. Or in other words, often it doesn't matter too much which local minima we are reaching because often, you know, they reach kind of similar performance, even they are very different with respect to the network parameters. So there's different network parameter configurations that reach different local minima, but they give similar performance in terms of like accuracy or regression losses. Um, and this is actually something, this intuition is quite important and I'm mentioning it here in this context. The idea is kind of the higher dimensional you go or the more quote unquote you over parameterize your neural network, meaning you, you know, you add more layers, you add more weights and stuff like this. Um, the more this property holds, meaning it's less sensitive to specific initializations. And at the end of the day, you're converging to something for the most part that is actually reasonably good in terms of performance. We'll talk about this one a little bit more, uh, but this is generally speaking when we're talking about gradient descent is a very, very important property um, that by definition, we cannot guarantee which local minima we're getting at the end if you're converging. Um, and neural networks are very convex, but it might not matter too much which local minima we are hitting. Um, however, one thing we can actually check very easily um, is the convergence. And the convergence um, is essentially, um, well, if you're doing an update step, are we actually still changing things? Again, we cannot control which local minima we're hitting. Um, but we can control how fast we're hitting it and we can control and check whether we hit it already. And there's these two considerations, which I mentioned, it's based on the learning rate, right? Um, the learning rate determines how fast you're converging and it could mean a good thing or it could mean a bad thing. It doesn't mean like you just need a higher learning rate because for instance, if your learning rate is too high and you have this quadratic function here, if your step size is too high, you're going to overshoot over your minimum. And then you're going to overshoot again and you overshoot again and you overshoot again. And the further you go away, in this case of this quadratic function, the larger your gradient gets and eventually you're diverging. So this is quite important to understand that if your learning rate is too high, you might actually overshoot, right? And overshooting means uh, we don't converge at all. We might actually diverge. That's not guaranteed that we're converging. However, we are able to check it because we can just look at the loss function. We can check, oh, if we're applying a bunch of gradient descent steps, at the end of the day, it might turn out that, you know, like our loss gets bigger and bigger. And that one we can see relatively quickly if we are plotting our training loss as we always should. On the other hand, if we're having a too small learning rate, um, then, well, we don't overshoot, but the downside is that it takes really a long time to converge, right? So we need many, many steps to do something, well, if we're estimating this point, we probably could have done one step here and we're already here. So here you can already see this, this like intricate balance, how to choose the learning rate is actually quite important and not that straightforward to address in practice, right? Um, and well, in, in, in reality um, or in practice, these functions are not these nice parabolas where like choosing a good learning rate would be easier. In practice, this looks more something like this here. Well, what does it mean? Well, we're going to have parts of a function which is, well, steeper and other parts which are shallower. Like the gradients are not always the same magnitude, uh, which means that choosing a global learning rate is actually not so straightforward to find. We'll later talk about how we do that. We have like learning rate schedules and stuff like this. But I just wanted to explain the problem here on this function because here we're having a very steep part of the function and here we're having this plateau, which is very flat. And in this flat region, you practically want to have larger gradients. And in this steep region, practically, sorry, in this plateau region, you're going to get 
smaller gradients, which means you want to have a larger learning rate. And in the steep region, you're going to get larger gradients. There you want to have a smaller learning rate, right? And this is important. And we're going to talk about this one a little bit, how this can be incorporated um, into our solver. Um, and in practice, these shallow regions here, these plateaus, they actually are kind of annoying for us, right? Because it might look like it's converged and it doesn't look like that it's getting much better if you're looking just at the loss function, so we have a marginal change. But in practice, once we over this plateau, it goes actually down a little bit more. And this is something that is very hard to see. Um, the only way to figure it out is like changing the learning rate probably adaptively and then checking if in the long run, after training for a very long time, if things still change. Um, also another thing, like if networks are already very well performing, you can tweak these things and check um, by changing learning rates if you can still squeeze a little bit more performance out of it and fit the function a bit better. Okay, um, so these functions that we are seeing here, these are two dimensional, but of course what we care about, we care about gradient descent in multiple dimensions. Um, there's various ways to visualize. Um, yeah, quick spoiler alert, going, going beyond dimension three is, is not that easy from a dimensional, from a, from a visualization standpoint. Um, well, we can do it here. Uh, for these dimensions here, it still works, right? Uh, so here we have uh, we have here our our energy landscapes as um, as these lines here. Um, so each of these rings here basically signals a certain energy value. This one is presumably zero or like very small, uh, and this one gets larger and larger. So the energy value along one of these rings here is always going to be or supposed to be the same. Now, if we want to do gradient descent, then right then we see here we have an x zero. We do one step. We have x1, we do another step, x2, another step, x3, and x4. And you see the gradients in this case are always orthogonal to the respective rings, right? So this is kind of the definition if you're having these uh, visualizations um, with these energy niveaus and you want to figure out how the gradients are, they're always orthogonal to these respective rings. Um, you can see here Another example, this is a, a more distorted version. Um, my orthogonality assumption here is a bit violated, but this is just because I drew it not in the right way. Um, but I wanted to exaggerate the point here. Uh, what you can already see here, if this is a relatively uniformly shaped circle here, and this is very anisotropically shaped circle, uh, you see very quickly that the gradients actually, <laughs> they go not always in the optimal path. And for that, these type of visualizations often make sense to explore it accordingly. Okay, um, well, you can also have these nice 3D plot visualizations. So here we have uh, two, we have a function j, we have two parameters, theta zero and, z and theta one, and the height, this in this height field visualization, the, the z value, the height, determines the respective function value. So what we care about is we want to find the smallest z value, meaning we want to find this point or this point, I don't know exactly which one is smaller here, and in these valleys, um, you want to find the respective minimum. So in this case, if we're starting here, right, gradient descent would somewhat go down here and then converge to this local minima, or it would go from here to here and converge to this local minima. Uh, which one it's going to choose depends, of course, on, on all the hyperparameters. It depends on the initialization. It depends on the learning rate steps and so on, right? Um, and what we have already talked about this is now for uh, for two variables we've visualized it with a height field um, for neural networks this is a little bit more difficult because we have of course many many more parameters uh, we have here up to a million of, of unknowns in our network um, and now what we would want to do though is we want to take this neural network and compute these gradients right um, and again we know how to do that because what we're doing here is we have here our gradient with respect to our parameters. Again, note the three indices. This is always very important to understand where we are. Um, and then what we want to do is we want to run gradient descent. Now, how do we do this in practice? Well, in practice, let's consider first a single training sample. So we have one training sample uh, in, in our training set. And from this, we want to compute gradients. And the way we do this is we consider the training sample. We have x, i and y, i. This is the input. This is the respective label. Uh, and we want our network, our function to approximate this training sample. So if we're putting x in, our neural network should predict y. That's the whole point of this one. Um, we have a loss function that measures how good this prediction is relative to this training sample. 
Um, and we want to find now the best model parameters. And again, the way we do this is we have um, our loss function. So we want to compute theta as the argmin of this loss function with respect to these uh, uh, xi and yi. In this case, we have only one of them. Um, and then we're running gradient descent. So what we do is we initialize theta with a random set of values. We'll later, again later talk about more how to initialize it. Um, and now what we do is we're computing our gradient. This is the gradient of these thetas with respect to the loss function and with respect to the training sample. We set a learning rate. Based on that, we're doing an update computation. So we take the current theta k and having one update with respect to the gradient, we're going to get a theta k plus one and then we iterate, right? And we're iterating until convergence, meaning that at some point we stop when the change of theta k plus one minus theta k is smaller than epsilon and is not going to change anymore. Okay. Um, yeah, that's what we want to do. Um, now, what does it mean? Well, we have uh, this function here in our update. We have here our weights and biases after the update step. We have our weights and biases from the current model. We have our learning rate. We have our gradient theta. We have our loss function. We have our current training sample. And we have the parameters theta k here as well. Okay, so this is the math, math, math behind it. Uh, the gradients with respect to the loss function, we compute via backpropagation. That's what we've done in the last lecture. So the whole point of the last lecture was to compute this little thing. Um, and now we have this very little annoying thing that the dimensionality of our gradient is the dimensionality of our parameters, like how many parameters theta do we have, the weights and the biases. And we have over a million parameters for an average neural network. We probably have even hundreds of thousands of parameters here. Um, and even modern networks might even have billions of these parameters. So this you can already see this makes it computationally quite expensive. However, if we only have a single training sample, this is relatively easy to do. Now, the, the, the challenge is going to come, what if we have multiple training samples? Well, what we do now is basically we have again, we have our loss function. We have multiple n training samples. So n is always going to be number of training samples. So we have from one training samples again, x, i, y, i. We have n of these ones and we still want to find our optimal theta. Now, how do we do this? Our cost is now simply, well, let's just sum up um, over all of these training samples. So our loss function, our cost function will go over n, right? It's the average loss across all the samples. Um, and then what we do is we use, uh, we use that entire cost function and we want to compute the gradients relative to that. Now, how do we do it? Well, now our losses, uh, our update steps are slightly changing. So the update step for multiple samples, uh, the big change is actually here, right? So now we are computing our loss, not just with respect to a single sample, but actually the gradient is now the av average in sum over all the residuals of all the training samples, right? Every training sample gives us certain constraints that we want to all incorporate in this, in this gradient computation, right? And what that means is, so from one to n here, we just go over one to n here, we compute the gradients of the loss function, um, and we use backprop for each training sample individually, right? So for each training sample, we need to run a backprop. Um, and this backprop is then going to give us uh, a gradient with respect to the training sample. Then what we do is we sum up all these gradients for all the training samples. Then we get the average gradient in total, and then we can do an update step, right? Um, maybe a quick notational issue. A lot of people are lazy and just write the gradient of the loss is just the sum here of all the gradients. Um, this one over n here um, is not wrong if you omit it. It just means rescaling the learning rate afterwards, right? So if you have a one over n, then alpha will be rescaled. And if you don't have it, it will be rescaled the other way around. So just if you see this in the literature, this is there's no good convention. I think people just do it as they please. 
Okay, um, so one thing I already promised you, um, there's this little bit of a side, side note, like for the people who know gradient descent, of course, uh, what you can actually do is you can, in this case, you can actually compute an optimal learning rate. You can figure out what alpha do I need to, for a given gradient, what alpha do I need to choose such that I get an optimal solution? Well, it's very straightforward. Um, what you do is you do a line search and line search means um, you compute the gradients. Um, then what you do is for this given gradient that is fixed right now, you want to say how much does, how do I find the minimum loss such that if I keep the parameters fixed right now, I do a parameter update, I put, I feed this parameter update into my loss again. Um, and I would like to find what makes, what alpha makes this loss the smallest. And that gives you then the theta K by doing the update step at the end, right? So you can do that um, in gradient descent. Um, and uh, because I made such a big fuss around how to find the good learning rate, the spoiler is this is not very practical because this basically solving this equation system means that we need to solve a huge system in every gradient descent step. And also, as a little spoiler, we need a lot of gradient steps to optimize a neural network. Um, okay, in fairness, you could say if you spend more effort in finding a good alpha, you didn't need that many training steps anymore. But as we shall see, um, this is not going to amortize very well. So you rather want to have more, potentially slightly more imprecise training steps, but uh, you wanted to figure out um, like how to make them as cheap as possible. Okay. So if you're going over that one, what we have just done, if you're going again, training, uh, training a network, um, doing gradient descent uh, on the entire training set, um, we will see we're running in a little bit of an issue very quickly. So let's say we have a network of 1 million, sorry, a network of 500,000 parameters and about a million labeled images, right? So my gradient right now has 500,000 dimensionality. That's how many parameters I have in the neural network. Uh, and this n, this little loop that I had to go to compute my cost function, um, unfortunately has to go over this one, over each of these 1 million training samples. Meaning we also need to run back propagation 1 million times to get the gradient for each of the training samples. And this, as you can imagine, is actually quite expensive and costly to compute. Um, and it's actually so expensive and costly to compute that for any reasonable neural network, this is not practical. So how do we fix it? How do we make it better? And the idea is relatively straightforward. So here we said, give him a large training set with n samples. And what that means is, given that training set, we want to figure out a gradient for that training set in which direction to go. The assumption is now that we can approximate that. So the idea is if we have these n training samples, uh, it's O of N to compute all of these. But the idea is we can probably approximate that function of all the training samples by just using a subset of that. So if we consider the problem as empirical risk minimization, we, ne we can express the total loss of the training data as an expectation over all the samples. And the idea is that instead of using then gradient descent, we want to use stochastic gradient descent. So, well, instead of using all the samples here, what we can do is we just use a subset of the samples, right? So the expectation here, we approximate it with a small subset of the data by saying, well, instead of going over one over N here, uh, we just have a sum over S here, right? And this S here is a very important parameter also. It's a very important hyperparameter. Um, and you can guess it if you have a very large M, uh, sorry, if you have a very large S here, then, or like if S is equal to N, then we, we practically do gradient descent, right? Um, so S should be smaller than, than this one, right? And the idea is that this is a lot faster. So now we have kind of this in, in this balancing challenge between well, how many samples do we use to compute a gradient to get possibly a better gradient versus how fast can you compute it, right? It's a speed versus accuracy of the gradient, right? And this is kind of interesting. We're going to talk about this one a bit.
Um, so what we have just done is that we have introduced stochastic gradient descent. This is called SGD. Uh, you're going to hear SGD quite a bit because this is our default optimization, what we're actually going to use. So we're never going to use real gradient descent. We're always going to use stochastic gradient descent. Um, and this little concept, what we just called was a mini batch. So this choose a subset of the training set, M here. Um, sorry, we should have called this one M here too. Uh, so this M here is smaller than the entirety of the M, right? Um, and the idea here is that each of these mini batches, that's how we're going to call it, right? A subset of the training um, is significantly smaller than the entirety of the training set. And hence, the gradient of one mini batch is a lot easier and faster to compute than the gradient of the entirety of the training set. Um, the last thing what is important is that the union of all the mini batches by definition is the entirety of the training set. So what you do in practice here is you actually going ahead and computing these batches bi ahead of training time, right? Uh, sometimes you resample at, at training as well, but for the most part, what people do is they actually go ahead to take a training set and they split this into individual mini batches up and then they keep these mini batches around for the entirety of the training process. Like how to select each mini batch is another question. But the point here is um, that you're gonna see everything at some point. So one sample is only and only in one mini batch and it's not in another mini batch. And this is an important concept um, because uh, that means after we have done gradient updates for each of these mini batches, we actually quote unquote have seen or the network has seen in the optimization, the entirety of the training data. Okay, and again, check out the indices here. I always like looking at the indices. So indices here, this index here tells you basically, uh, this is the first or this is the ith mini batch. In the ith mini batch, we're gonna have m samples. So m is the number of samples in this mini batch. And in total, we have n over m mini batches, right? So the larger our mini batches, larger m is, the fewer mini batches we have. And the smaller m is, the more mini batches we have, right? Okay, couple of practical considerations here. Um, the mini batch size is also a hyperparameter. Um, and the hyperparameter, as I mentioned, this is a little bit of a balancing act. Smaller batch size means greater variance in the gradients. Larger batch size uh, means less variance in the gradients. So if you have better gradient approximations, you, are, you presumably converge faster. If you have noisier, gradient approximations, then presumably your updates will be faster, but the convergence will be slower, right? So this is kind of the, the tricky thing, convergence versus update per mini batch. Um, for the most part, when we are talking about neural networks, we are always on the noisier set of SGD. Um, in other words, our networks in practice are so large that we will be limited by GPU memory to do the backward pass across all of these samples in one mini batch in parallel, right? Practically, this is how people setting the mini batch size. Um, there's a couple of more considerations. I probably can't go into all the details here, but I wanted to give you a few considerations here. Um, so you can actually go ahead and, and serialize the computation of the updates of a mini batch. So in other words, you're running out of GPU memory. Uh, but your gradients are still noisy for a single mini batch, you could go ahead um, and basically compute the gradients of a part of a mini batch first, and then you have another pass which didn't quite fit in the GPU memory, you're doing it for the second part of the mini batch, and then you accumulate these gradients. This is a process called gradient accumulation. Um, it's very common to do that. So you could trade, quote unquote, runtime, meaning that you need more backward passes, that you cannot do everything in the same time in parallel. Um, and for that reason, uh, you might sacrifice a bit of update performance, meaning you don't do that many update steps, right? Um, and the reason because of this is, um, whenever you're going to start in deep learning, uh, people will always check how much GPU memory you have, because the GPU memory is really critical right now for the mini batch size selection. Right? In other words, if you have larger GPUs, you can train bigger networks and use larger mini batches. And if you can use more larger mini batches, your training presumably converges faster. So a better GPU 
doesn't just help you because it runs faster, it also helps you because it can fit more memory. Um, and because of that, you converge faster too, right? Um, few more considerations. Um, I didn't talk about this typically the power of two here. Um, so typically a mini batch size is chosen between 8, 16, 32, 64, 128 and so on. Um, the reason why you're choosing power of two, um, it has nothing to do with mathematical considerations. It has mostly to do something with how the GPU architectures works. So since everything runs on a graphics card, you want to maximize the runtime here. Um, and typically the graphics card is composed into, into thing called streaming multiprocessors. These are parallel vector units. Uh, and they can execute a certain computation in parallel. But the little downside of the graphics cards is everybody in this computation, in this vector unit, um, they have to do the same computation. So you can do different computations at the same time. Um, and the way you exploit the GPU is basically you want to make sure that you're doing as many parallel computations as possible from samples in this case that all need the same computation. So you can do better parallel processing. And typically on the GPU, these streaming multiprocessors, they can handle a power of two different, um, uh, well, <laughs> uh, well, I don't want to introduce too many, too many things now, but um, so basically they, they can handle power of twos um, better than they can handle non-power of twos. So these streaming multiprocessors, they typically execute literally in hardware, a certain power of two in parallel. And then you can have a certain number of uh, they call blocks in CUDA. Uh, these blocks, um, they can run in parallel as well. And then you also want to have those ones um, for the compute in power of two. So from a practical perspective, for instance, if you said you have instead of eight, you're choosing seven here. So seven would run as fast as eight in practice in many cases, right? Because it doesn't exploit this parallelism with these um, called SIMD instructions, like um, um, yeah, single data, multiple instruction, uh, sorry, <laughs> single instruction, multiple data, SIMD. Um, and these SIMD um, architectures, they use these power of two things. And because of that, um, at the end of the day, your batches are going to be power of two. If you're doing this in practice, um, of course, um, you might not necessarily start with implementing everything QD on your own. Although I highly recommend it because it's a good experience to understand how these things work. Um, the little downside here is that if you are doing that, in PyTorch, it abstracts all the CUDA stuff away from you. Like there's some kernels in CUDA and these CUDA kernels, um, they kind of run certain things. But what's going to happen is if you change the mini batch size by, for instance, from eight to nine, you will suddenly see a massive performance drop because it might need uh, a second block running in parallel on your GPU. Uh, so choosing these power of tools wisely is important. And knowing that these considerations, they affect how the GPUs work, that's also important because it makes a massive difference with respect to the runtime. Okay, um, all right, let's go back to SGD. Uh, let's make a practical example here. For instance, we have a training set that has two to the power of 20, about 1 million images, right? Two to the power of 10 is uh, 1024, so this is 1024 squared um, images. Uh, we use a batch size of m equal to 64, meaning we have about 16,000 mini batches. So 64 times 16,000 is about a million, it's about two to the power of 20. Um, and these are then the mini batches we can use and choose from. We're dividing this training set into 16K mini batches and we're running them iteratively as we go. Um, one term you might hear a lot here is this term of epoch. An epoch means a complete pass through the training set, meaning that we have iterated throughout all of these mini batches. In this case, after 16,000 threaded upstate steps, each with one mini batch, we have completed one epoch. Um, and often when you're talking with colleagues about, oh, how's your training going? Oh, I've trained for 10 epochs. This is a thing you will hear very often. So this concept of epochs is quite important because it often measures, you know, how much and well-trained your current network is at the time. All right, so this is SGD. Um, not that complicated, I would say. Um, also mathematically, uh, we can also write it down the same way. So if we are saying K here, K does not mean the nth update step of the entirety of the training set anymore. K now means it's the kth iteration 
meaning that the kth mini batch has been seen. And if k is larger than the total number of mini batches, it would mean we have completed one epoch um, and we are reseeing other mini batches at the same time. Uh, if you're computing the loss, now this is not an n anymore, but it's an m. m is now the number of training samples in the current mini batch. What we have established is this should probably be a power of two. Um, and we have established this terminology, what I already mentioned implicitly, the iteration, that's how many times you do a gradient update step, that's how many times you apply this formula here. Uh, and then epochs is once we have gone throughout the entirety of our training set. Okay, um, this is SGD. Um, there's actually a lot of literature around SGD. We're going to talk about a few things that we will need to make it a bit faster. Um, but this plain SGD already works remarkably well. Uh, and there's a small little anecdote what people in the 80s have been saying, right? So even you today might learn in like, you know, linear algebra classes or so, um, how to do optimizations. And a lot of people have thought, oh, we're going to do second order optimizations. And it turns out when neural networks were a big thing, SGD was the thing that beat all the second order optimizations. Um, and it was at the time when people started using like backprop SGD combinations, um, this was very unconventional and everybody thought, oh, well, theoretically this shouldn't work, but in practice it works pretty well. And nowadays, like a few decades later, we also have a good understanding from a research perspective why that is the case. So there's a lot of theory, theoretical foundation behind it. Um, I want to mention a couple of things I think that are important. Um, one thing is really important is the convergence of SGD. Um, suppose we want to minimize the function f of theta with a stochastic approximation. So here's our stochastic approximation. Um, this is our h here, uh, where alpha 1, alpha 2, and so on, and alpha n is a sequence of positive step sizes. Um, and h of theta k in x is the unbiased estimate of the gradient of f. Um, and the important thing here is, you will already see is like why people are splitting this up. The learning rate, for instance, is not always constant in my change. The only assumption that people are having here is this is a positive step sizes uh, and we have this unbiased estimate. And then there's this um, rule, it's uh, Robbins and Monroe, um, it's a stochastic approximation method. It's actually quite old, it's from 51 already. Um, and it says the convergence of SGD converges to a local minimum if the following conditions are met. If all the alpha n's are greater or equal to zero, if n is greater than zero, if, if you're summing up all the alpha n's, it goes to infinity, right? Otherwise you could set all the alphas to zero, like if all of them are zero, it doesn't work. And if alpha squared, is smaller than infinity, if you're summing all of these ones up. And these three conditions here, they tell you that SGD is guaranteed to converge. So this might be important once we are trying to figure out what are good uh, update rules for our respective step sizes. And the fourth condition here is if F is strictly convex, then we know that this is also going to be a global minimum. So this fourth condition means it's a global minimum. Okay, right. Um, and yeah, and this is the proposed sequence by Robbins and Monroe. Um, this is, and again, this is already done 51. It was a while ago. There's a lot more literature behind it. But the point I wanted to make here is that you can actually prove when and under which conditions SGD is converging and help to make, for instance, selections for learning rates and stuff like this. Of course, this is just scratching the surface. There's a lot more literature beyond uh, beyond this lecture here. Um, might be interesting to look it up, but I wanted to just point out a few things. Okay, so, so far, SGD is quite cool, right? If we're summarizing what SGD is doing, it's breaking down the gradient descent stuff into the computation of individual mini batches. And based on these ones, we can do faster and more update steps. Okay, um, the problems of SGD, um, however, still exist. There's a couple of things we have to, or we should do in practice to make it a bit more efficient. Um, and that's actually very easy to do. Um, 
But in order to do that, we have to understand what are the things we have to address. Okay, so one big problem is if we're having a neural network, right? We have a very, very high dimensionality. The gradient here is actually scaled equally across all dimensions. Or in other words, uh, I can't change the learning rate uh, between different dimensions. So they cannot independently scale the directions, which is, which is a, a fundamental problem actually. And we'll see that this is a real issue. So what we would have to do is we need to set the learning rate such that we have a conservative minimum bound of the learning rate to avoid, conver uh, to avoid divergence in any of the directions. So quote unquote, the slowest dimension um, determines how small the learning rate has to be. And what that means is for all other dimensions, that means that it's much, much slower than actually necessary. And this is a big problem. Um, again, finding good learning rate itself, we'll do the next lecture. But now I wanted to talk about how can we go ahead and scale the directions independently. And this is this kind of idea is actually guiding a lot of the different gradient based um, or the, a lot of the, the SGD variations. I mean, in principle, they, are, they account also for standard gradient descent, but we're going to talk about this in the, in the context of SGD because we're talking about neural networks. Okay, so let's have a look at this. Okay, the first idea, what we want to do is gradient descent with momentum. Um, so let's pick this two-dimensional problem here. So we have this two-dimensional energy landscape, our minimum is somewhere here, and our initialization is somewhere here. If we're running plain gradient descent, right, our, our, our optimization path will look something like this. So we're going to chitter around here um, because we have two dimensions and our gradients are not equally scaled, right? So our gradients, if we're taking, if we can't scale each of the dimensions independently because our function here is distorted, we will make unnecessary gradient steps up and down, right? Um, and this is obvious because this dimension here is just squished down. Um, so what we'd love to do here is uh, we would love to go a lot faster in the x-axis here, i.e. we want to accumulate gradients, right? We know it's always going in this direction, just go faster. Um, and we would like to avoid making too many steps back and forth across the y-dimension here. So we would love to, to track this and, and average this kind of out over time. And now the idea to modify gradient descent or, or SGD then um, is to apply momentum. Um, and momentum specifically addresses this problem here. Momentum says accumulate gradients. Well, how would you do this? It's actually quite straightforward. The core idea here is, well, if you had already gone in this direction, just sum up the direction from the previous step. So, what we do here is we have an exponentially weighted average of the gradients over the history of all gradients. So if in our function, we are always pointing in a certain direction, we're going to accumulate all the gradients in this direction and it's getting larger and larger. If in a direction, the gradients is suddenly changing, then the, then the, 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 the accumulated gradients will not accumulate, right? Because they will cancel out eventually. Uh, and that's a really good thing. So, Gradients that are contradicting over time will cancel out and gradients that are matching will sum up and accumulate. That's the idea here. Um, and the way you do this mathematically is you have these, these update formulas. So instead of having just this gradient update step, we're going to have this update formula here. So what do we have here? Well, we have here, um, we have here a velocity. Let's start here. The velocity is essentially the accumulation of the gradients. So this first thing here is not updating any parameters. This first thing is just accumulating gradients. So we're just accumulating here. So what we do here is we're computing the gradient of the function, or in this case of the mini batch, because we're using SGD. We have a learning rate, like how much do we do that? Um, and then we're just taking the previous velocity and adding the current gradient up to get the gradient of the next step, right? So all, all this first, all this line here is doing, it's saying take the Take the current gradient, add it to the previous gradient, and just keep summing up gradients. Keep keep summing up. Keep summing up. Um, and this is an exponential weighted average, 
based on this beta factor here. This is called the accumulation rate or the, the friction of the momentum. Friction is also a term you might hear a couple of times, right? If this parameter is really uh, is zero, let's just say this parameter here would be zero, uh, then we would just keep the current gradient. We would just do standard gradient descent. If this parameter would be one, then we would weight the previous gradient and the current gradient by one to one, right? So we have to balance these two ones out here, right? Um, and then what we do is, instead of using the gradient for the update of the parameters, we just use the current velocity, which is the accumulated gradients, right? So this is actually a very, very simple but very smart idea, right? The, the only idea here is we're just going to sum up gradients as we have them to get a new gradient. This is the velocity. And we're using that one uh, to update our parameters afterwards. Um, and this is really straight forward to implement because all you're going to do is you're going to just keep another set of, of, of this of this velocity vector around. Um, why is that important? Well, um, oh yeah, this is something we haven't really talked about too much. Um, if you're taking an equation like this one, um, and I have this, I ask this always in interview questions, by the way, too, so <laughs> um, maybe be careful and listen. Um, so if you're taking these update steps, where do you guess is the most computational resources that you need to do? Um, for instance, let's, let's just say here, this is just an addition of two vectors. Okay. All right. Okay. We have a lot of parameters. Let's say we have a million parameters on our networks, that these are a million additions. Okay. It's a million additions. Here we have beta, which is a scalar. It's a single scalar times the velocity. This is also a million dimension. This is also the number of weights. Uh, so it's a million single scalar multiplications. Same thing with alpha. Now, here is computing the gradients. And we remember from the last lecture, in order to compute the gradients, we have to do this whole backpropagation thing, right? Backpropagation means go through layer by layer, first do a forward pass, then go through layer by layer, backtrack the gradients, apply the chain rule, and so on. So for the GPU, Adding two vectors up together, even if it's the size of a million, is nothing. But that's like nothing. It doesn't doesn't even matter. You can you can hardly measure that time. However, computing the gradients in the backward pass, that's where all the stuff happens. This is where everything happens that costs compute. Um, and the core idea right now is basically to make sure that we don't need to do as many gradient computations. In other words, we're trying, to, we're trying to modify gradient descent such that we converge faster and have to do fewer update steps such that we have to do fewer backprop steps. That's actually the whole point here. We're trying to get better gradient approximations to get better convergence so we don't have to do that much of this stuff. This is, by the way, this is all of it. The whole neural network stuff, the whole reason why we're using GPUs, the reason why we're trying to parallelize stuff, the reason why we use SGD in the first place is we want to make well, we have to handle this gradient computation. Gradient computations is the bottleneck of neural network training. Make that faster, and this comes to faster training speeds. Okay, so this is a little bit for the motivation. Um, but now going back to momentum. Momentum, again, here the idea was we want to go ahead and accumulate the gradients over time in this exponentially weighted average fashion. Um, and in this exponentially weighted average fashion, eventually you're going to get updated gradients. And from these updated gradients, uh, we hope that they are a better approximation of the function. And yeah, so the idea here is, um, basically, if you have these distorted functions, it's going to figure out and help us out to go better in the right direction. So the step here will be largest when the sequence of gradients all point to the same direction. Um, there's a small thing we have to be careful about. So whenever we're doing this, we are also introducing a bunch of hyperparameters. Well, the hyperparameter alpha, we already had before, right? Our, our learning rate. Uh, that's something, again, we're going to talk about this a lot later. Um, for this lecture, you just have to believe me, it's not so straightforward, but we have to talk about it later. Um, and we have this beta now. Beta is an accumulation rate that we just introduced. Um, fortunately, beta is not so finicky than alpha. So beta here typically is set to 0.9 and in practice, nobody ever is going to touch it. Like for the most part in deep learning land, um, across all kinds of architectures, beta is often set to 
it's not going to make such a big difference for many of the problems, actually. Okay, um, maybe a bit of a higher level question, what momentum does, right? Again, momentum like accumulates gradients and then like rescales kind of across dimensions to a certain level. Um, one question arises, can momentum overcome local minima? Um, and this is often that people, well, misconceive a little bit, right? Um, and th this is important to understand. Like, momentum itself, if you're thinking about it, it, it changes the magnitude of gradients across dimensions. So, of course, if we are moving down here and we're building up momentum, we might overcome this local minima, right? So, like, like it gets faster and faster because the gradients accumulate up the way down. We're accelerating um, and we're overcoming this local minima. And what it does is essentially it changes the path we're going because it, changes, it makes it fast, fast, faster. And because it makes it faster, we're computing gradients at different places in the function. And because of that, we might actually converge to different local minima. Right? So we have, we have something like this, what could happen here. Now, can it overcome local minima? Well, the answer is clearly yes, it can do that. Now, does it lead to a better local minima? That one is not so clear, right? Specifically in this case, we see, well, this local minima is clearly better than this local minima. But with momentum, we overshot here a little bit and went to the other local minima. Um, so there's this misconception that, oh, I'm not converging to the right local minima. Let's just use, gradient, uh, let's just use momentum um, to get a better local minima. Yes, it may happen, but it's not, it, by, by no means does momentum get you a better local minima. It might get you to, it might just, it's like changing the hyperparameters, right? It changes how we, how we approach the function, but it's not necessarily getting a better version of it. However, as we have said before, if we're talking about optimization, in optimization land, um, especially with neural networks, it might not be that important which local minima we're getting into. I'm going to talk about this a bit later again, but um, for now, um, please have to ask you for a bit of patience there. Okay, but what's important for now, it can overcome local minima, but not necessarily improve them by default. It might make them worse, as we have seen here. Okay, so there's a couple of variations of this. Um, this was standard momentum. It's very common. People use it. Um, there's a lot of variations. I'm not going to go to all of them, but I want to introduce a key concepts. Um, one idea is called nestor of momentum um, or called look ahead momentum. The idea here is very similar to momentum. What we want to do, we want to accumulate uh, a certain velocity here, right? However, th so this is the velocity update here. So you see we have three, three terms here. Let's start with the middle one. The middle one looks very, or the, the, the bottom one is straightforward. Take the velocity, update the weights, get a new set of weights. That's straightforward, right? That's the same thing what we had in the previous momentum. Um, the second line here um, is also very similar to momentum. Um, it's basically saying, well, all right, so I'm back. Um, my recording unfortunately stopped for a second, so I hope this still works out and I don't have to re-record the whole lecture. Um, so what we have done right now, we've looked at the different momentums um, and we started with the Nestor momentum. So here, the nest of momentum here, um, again, we have seen this is the update step with the weights. Um, and this one here looks very similar to the standard momentum. Like we're just accumulating velocity and we're accumulating and accumulating. So there's one little thing that is different. And one little thing here is that here we're looking not up the parameters. Theta, we're not computing the gradient of the parameters theta, what we did in the standard momentum. Instead, we are actually computing the parameters at theta tilde. And theta tilde is nothing else by already adding the velocity to the weights beforehand. So in a sense, this kind of combines two things, right? It kind of goes ahead and um, updates the parameters theta first with the current velocity. Um, then what it does, it takes these intermediate parameters theta tilde computes the new gradient at where the velocity would have been, sorry, where, where the gradient would have been, and then updates the velocity based on this update already. So it looks ahead. That's why it's called look ahead momentum. 
Uh, then it updates the velocity and uses the updated velocity in order to update the actual weights. So these theta tilde, they are not being used as actual parameters of the networks. So the current update is just being used to compute the gradients, not at the current step, but it computes the gradient as if we had followed the velocity for one more step. So it kind of looks ahead. And the idea is by looking ahead this way, we want to get a better approximation of the respective gradients in this case. Okay, uh, so let's have a look how, how, how this looks. Um, well, you basically say if you do blue here is standard momentum, right? So we're accumulating velocities. So we do step, step, and so on. Um, and this look ahead momentum says basically, well, um, we, we check out, we make this jump here. This is this part here. We just uh, add the velocity here. Uh, we check out the gradient here, which is this one here. We make a correction. Then we measure the gradients where you end up. And with this correction, then you do the actual update step, which is this step. And the assumption this works better than computing the gradients where you had been before. Um, also, if you're going quickly back here, I wanted to still explain the computed stuff. All in all of this stuff here, the computer is all cheap, except this stuff here is expensive. The backprop stuff is the most expensive stuff. The rest is not very expensive. Okay, this was Nestor Fomentum. It's a small variation, sometimes being used. Not that often anymore, but it, I still wanted to illustrate the concept. Um, but the, 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 the combined thing of a shared property of, of these two momentum things is basically that we accumulate gradients. So if we're always going in the same direction, we accumulate gradients in these directions. And in other directions where they contradict, we don't accumulate gradients. Now, the opposite thing you can also do. You can essentially penalize fluctuating gradients. And this is a thing what root mean squared prop does, RMS prop. The idea is the opposite to momentum. It's saying, well, if you're having an energy landscape like this, you're getting large gradients in this direction and small gradients in this direction. But these gradients here, they are varying, right? They, they're like fluctuating quite a bit. So what we would like to do is we would like to divide the, the learning rate in dimensions where you have high fluctuation by the square of these gradients, right? So RMS provides divides essentially each component of the gradient by an exponentially decaying average of squared gradients. And squared gradients is important. The, the word squared is important because if you're having large gradients, the square will be disproportionately larger than the square of small gradients because the square function grows quadratically. Okay, mathematically, this looks like that. So what we do here is we're computing the gradients of our loss using the gradients of our loss. Um, and what we would like to do, we have this S here. Um, we combining our S with the previous S with the, the component, the element wise multiplication or the element wise squares of our partial derivatives in a sense, right? So we're going ahead and taking each component of the gradient, we're squaring it and we accumulating up kind of this exponential weighted average of squared gradients. And then what we do, when we do an update step, we are doing, an, uh, we're dividing um, the components of our gradient with these squares for each of the components. And we add a little epsilon so we don't divide by zero, right? Um, so in other words, what we're doing right now is we are going ahead and we're computing like these square components of the gradients and we're saying, well, if these get larger, then the square will be disproportionately larger than the square of the smaller gradients. So this term here will penalize large gradient fluctuations more, relatively speaking, to smaller gradient fluctuations. Okay, that's the whole idea. Okay, now we have a bunch of hyperparameters here. Um, these hyperparameters are alpha, learning rate needs tuning, talked about it. We have beta, which is this update, exponential update variable. And we have epsilon, which makes sure we don't divide by zero. Okay, so beta here is always set to 0.9. That's just what it is. Don't change it. Don't need to change it. And this epsilon is always set to 10 to the power of minus eight. Also, don't need to change it. It's for the most part, this is good. Um, 
And what we have done mathematically, we kind of, this sum of average squares here, or this, this average squared term is basically the variance, right? So we're saying if we're having a high variance in a certain direction, we want to penalize that high, uh, if you have high variance, we want to scale down the gradient in that respective component. And this is exactly what's happening here. And I want to go over this one again, because this is important to understand. We have our two dimensional function, x direction has small gradients, y direction has large gradients. Um, now we have this RMS prob update, right? We do this, the component wise multiplication with itself. We have here this, um, how do we set the respective um, uh, exponential average between the previous squares. So we have an exponentially weighted squares and then we are penalizing gradients with a large variance. And in this concrete step, what we're doing is in the X direction, we're dividing uh, by large. So we're dividing by square gradients, meaning that in the uh, Y direction, we will have large gradients, meaning we will have a division that is large. And in the X direction, we'll have small gradients so we'll divide by a small value here right um, this is or i mentioned it this is the uncentered variance of the gradients um, it's also the second momentum right before when we're calling the momentum method it's the first momentum this one rms prop is the second momentum um, and yeah so the idea is very very straightforward now so because we are penalizing these outliers um, what we can do then in practice, I mean, you would ask, why on earth does it help us if we're dividing by something? Well, because we're getting rid of these outlier gradients um, across certain dimensions, we can effectively increase the learning rate. Right? Otherwise, this wouldn't make sense. So because we can now increase overall learning rate, RMS prop kind of helps to uniformly scale the gradients across certain directions. Um, so if we have directions that vary a lot, then we're not so sure about it, right? We have high variance. Uh, we want to scale it down. And in other directions, we don't scale it down as much because we are more sure about it. And then globally, we increase the learning rate. And then we actually um, can get this RMS prop to work. Okay. RMS prop demons the oscillations for high variance directions. What I just said, can you use faster learning rate because it is less likely to diverge. We don't have to pay so much attention anymore. Uh, speeds of learning speed. It's also called a second momentum. Now, you might ask, well, if you're looking carefully at uh, these terms, well, that what RMS prop is doing sounds pretty good. But it also sounds pretty good for the momentum method we have seen before. And you might ask, well, which one is better? Well, the answer is they are pretty orthogonal, right? Because one of them is accelerating and accumulating gradients. And this one here, RMS prop, is dampening variations that are high. And now the obvious answer is, well, can we actually combine these two things and combine these two ideas? Uh, and the answer is yes. And this leads us to Adam. It's called adaptive moment estimation, Adam. Um, the idea here is combine momentum and RMS prop. So now we want to build velocity, but we also want to dampen high variances. Okay, so what do we do here is we have two intermediate variables. One is called m and one is called v. m is the mean and v is the variance. Okay, so what do we do here? Compute the gradient at theta k. We have an exponential weighted average with the previous gradient. So we're just going to keep accumulating, right? This was momentum. And we have the second term, which is the RMS prop term, which is computing the square mean, right? This is this variance here. Um, it's the unsended variance, like, um, but uh, this is accumulating these square terms. And then what we're doing is we're taking the mean, we're dividing, we're scaling it, plus have this epsilon, and this way we're combining momentum and RMS prop, right? So here we have the first momentum and the mean gradients, and here we're going to have the second momentum and the variance of gradients, right? And this leads to this R, uh, to this combination atom. And also as a, as a spoiler here, Adam is the method of choice. Like Adam is the way to go, what everybody pretty much uses. I mean, there are certain ways, sometimes people use still SGD, vanilla SGD, sometimes people use RMS prop momentum independently. For the most part, if you're talking about neural network land, people will use Adam. Okay. Um, yeah, a couple of 
things. Um, what happens here is if k is equal to zero, um, there's a small issue that I have conveniently ignored for the sake um, of the explanation. Um, because one thing is we at k equal to zero, we have a bit of a problem here because this m and this v is actually has a bit of a bias because m is equal to zero at the beginning and the variance is also equal to zero at the beginning. So because of that, this is not the actual updated rule of Adam. What we have to do now is we have to make sure we correct for this bias when it comes close to zero. Um, from an understanding perspective, this doesn't change it, but we have to correct this bias. Um, and because m and v are zero initialized, um, it's a bias to zero. So now what we do is we simply um, update the rules respectively and have here uh, m over one minus beta and v tilde is v over one minus beta two. Uh, this is important um, because we need to fix this bias correction, right? Otherwise, the zero of iteration in a sense, we don't know where we are at the beginning. We don't have a history of gradients at the beginning and because we have to do that. Now, this is the actual atom rule, um, but this is pretty clear, right? Because you just need to figure out this case that at the beginning you don't have history yet. Okay, now again, if you're summarizing everything together, it looks like that. Um, we have a bunch of more hyperparameters now. Um, we have beta one and beta two and epsilon. So beta one is always set to 0.9, beta two is always set to 0.99. Um, epsilon is set to 10 to the power of minus eight. These are actually the defaults in PyTorch. Uh, and then you're gonna get these respective update steps that you need to use to apply Adam. So to reiterate, Adam exponentially decaying mean and variance of gradients combines first and second order momentum. Uh, very straightforward. One is accumulating gradients, the other one is dampening gradients. The idea is you're combining these two ideas of first order momentum and RMS prop in one method. Um, and as I said, this is typically the choice what currently neural networks do. Right. Okay. Um, there are actually a couple of others. We're not going to go to all of these ones. Um, just um, as, a, as a bit of an overview, we've talked about vanilla SGD. We've talked momentum, RMS prop. Um, and then there's a bunch of other ones like Ada Grad, Ada Delta, Ada Max, Nada, I, AMS grad, there's a lot of different ones. Um, they all kind of have similar ideas, right? What we have just seen. Um, Adam is typically the method of choice, um, but I, the more important thing right now, what I wanted to get across in this lecture is that you can see that it makes sense how to leverage the history of gradients to get more information how to do the respective updates. Um, it's pretty fun actually to play around with these. Um, you can also visualize it. Um, you get pretty immediate feedback. Um, here's a couple of visualizations I wanted to show. So here we have different optimizers, SGD, Momentum, NAG, Adagrad, Ada Delta, RMS prop. Um, and you see in this, in this energy landscape, it makes quite a big difference in how the convergence goes. So you see the red one here, like this little one here, this is standard SGD. SGD has a consistent learning rate, always goes very steady, but it's slow. The other ones are a lot faster because you have like various ways of momentum, how to accumulate gradients. You have momentum, the green one, you see it overshoots heavily here, right? Because it goes too fast. Um, so you need to um, figure out what to do here and so on. So this is kind of nice. Um, we see a few more visualizations here. This is a very tricky one. Um, this is a very nasty energy landscape because the gradient here um, SGD gets completely stuck here, right? Because the, the, the gradient has to accelerate in this direction and it always has to accelerate, but it's very small at the beginning in this direction, right? Like you have to go in this direction forward, but the gradient itself is very small. So you have to accumulate it over many steps. And if you don't accumulate it, it takes forever or based on whatever numerics, you're never gonna get out of this one. Um, yeah, if you see like things like momentum or so, um, it doesn't get out here either, or at least it takes some time, I think. Um, whereas RMS prop so this is like a very, this is a canonical case where RMS prop is pretty good. Okay, a um, couple of more examples here. This is an interesting one because here we have different local minima and the different solvers, they all go to different local minima here. Um, 
because it's a complicated energy function and it's not so clear which one it should go to. So which path to take is also quite of dependent um, based on the respective method of choice. Okay, this was basically the gradient stuff. Um, it was like the way I explained it here was basically based on gradient descent, but in practice, this is the same thing for SGD, right? Because it doesn't matter how you compute the gradients respectively. Um, this just matters how you leverage the history of computed gradients over iterations. Okay, I wanted to go a little bit over some basic math and generally speaking to give you a little bit of a context of, global, of a global overview of optimization methods. Um, the reason why I want to do that is uh, in the past, I have seen that people taking machine learning courses, they kind of forget their basic linear algebra. Um, so I want to do, although this is a very practically oriented course that you know aims to teach you how to train neural networks, I still want to make sure that you know you're not forgetting the basic math stuff here and put it into correlation accordingly. So if we're doing these kind of things, here we have um, a bunch of definitions, right? So what we have talked about, we have talked about derivatives, we've talked about gradients, uh, we have Jacobians and we have Hessians. We've talked about all of these ones so far um, and I, I'm sure you know all of these ones. Um, so far what we had been doing, we had been using solvers that are all based on gradients. However, I already mentioned it briefly, you can also use second order derivatives to get quote unquote better solvers. Uh, and also this is not something that should be totally new to you. Uh, in fact, Newton's method is leveraging um, a Taylor expansion series of a function by using the second order approximation, right? So gradient descent, first order approximation, Newton's method uses the second order approximation. So what the Taylor series is doing for you, it just takes a function, right? And you can expand this, or you can approximate this function by expanding this Taylor series. And the way you do this is you have this formula that says, oh, this is the zeroth derivative, quote unquote, this is the first derivative, and this is the second derivative, right? And this would go on to, to nth derivatives, but Newton's method actually leverages up to the second derivative. So we have here a first derivative, and we have here a second derivative, the curvature. And the idea now here is Newton's method approximates the function here this way. And by approximating this function, uh, you can lead to this update rule. This update rule says, well, uh, this was SGD, right? We have here the gradient updates. You have K, you have alpha, you have K plus theta K plus one. Uh, and here the idea is instead of computing like this alpha here, we're going to change the alpha times uh, the inverse of the Hessian matrix. Right? So this way, you're actually getting rid of the learning rate. And in fact, you're checking out the curvature information, the second order information based on the second order Taylor function. So in other words, we are treating this as a quadratic function um, and trying to minimize it as if it was a quadratic function locally. Um, and then we're getting this update step based on this Hessian matrix. Um, and this is something that I believe you must have heard already, right? It's like, um, uh, it's like the root finding of the first derivative, right? Like this leads to this update function essentially. Um, and the thing is in neural network land, we have here parameters and a network of a million, right? So we have a million parameters or tens of millions, hundreds of millions. The only little issue that we have here is this Hessian matrix here has, has K squared entries, right? Like it's a square matrix um, and each dimension is the number of parameters. So this is K squared. Um, and the computational complexity of this inversion function here is actually O of K cubed, no matter whether you solve it with a system or whether you do an actual inversion. Uh, spoiler, by the way, you always do, an, uh, you'd always do a linear solve here, um, but more to this later. Okay, so the advantage if we're doing optimizations with the Newton method compared to gradient descent is that Newton exploits the curvature it treats the function as a local quadratic function. Um, and the idea there is you're taking a more direct road because this green, you see that the curvature here is not considered. So it kind of has this, it goes a longer route whereas the red takes a more direct path and Newton's method is significantly faster 
when it comes to the number of iterations. I even need fewer iterations to do the optimizations. The little downside here is we need a lot more compute per iteration. That's the downside, right? So you spend more effort in computing this Hessian, inverting it, um, but you need a lot fewer iterations. Um, there's one drawback of Newton's method. Um, well, sorry, like, I guess the first thing is, well, what happens if you apply Newton's method to a linear regression? Um, linear regression, remember, was this, this least squares function. Um, and I already spoiled it to a certain level, basically, because the Newton's method, as I said, treats the function locally as quadratic. This here is a quadratic function, right? It's the linear regression with the normal equation. Um, in this case, you're obviously converging after one step. So Newton's method is just literally, you need one Newton step here, right? And one Newton step uh, helps you to converge. But yeah, so Newton's method has a couple of challenges though. So one challenge is this Hessian matrix is pretty heavy. Um, so you want to approximate it potentially. Um, one way to approximate it is with BFGS or LBFGS. So BFGS and LBFGS are second order solver approximations. So you want to approximate the inverse Hessians. So BFGS stands for Broyden Fletcher Goldfab Shannon algorithm. Um, and this is a method family called quasi Newton. So quasi Newton means always, well, Hessian matrix is nasty or expensive to compute. Uh, let's approximate it in a, in a, in a, in a ideally good way, in an efficient way. Okay, and this Hessian approximation here, then BFGS has n squared memory requirements, whereas LBFGS can get this down to n. So they kind of, so LBFGS is kind of doing a low rank approximation of the Hessian over iterations. Um, it starts, uh, yeah, and th this one starts basically by keeping it all in a vector and then updating this low rank approximation in place in this one vector. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details if you're interested, but this is a very efficient way of, of doing, doing update steps here. Uh, another method that falls into this is Gauss-Newton. And this is um, also very, uh, a very important method for many things. So the idea here is that if this is the Gauss-Newton update step with this Hessian, uh, these true second order derivatives are often hard to obtain based on numerics. So what you can do is you can compute the Hessian with two times JTJ, where J is the Jacobian matrix. So two times the Jacobian matrix transpose times the Jacobian matrix approximates the Hessian. Um, so it uses all the mixed derivatives, but the, the true second derivatives are being omitted here. Um, and then it leads to this update step, right? It's just replacing the Hessian inverse with two times JTJ. Um, and then what you can do is you can solve a linear system for the update steps of Gauss Newton. And again, this is just, again, inverting a matrix is very unstable. So nobody uses this in practice. Everybody would always solve uh, that system here. And then you have basically in every iteration of Gauss Newton, you have to solve this linear system. Uh, and then you're going to get the respective updates um, uh, for each Gauss Newton step here. Okay. Um, and now there's a couple of variations of Gauss Newton. Uh, one variation is the Levenberg method. It's kind of a, it, it's like a dampening version of Gauss-Newton. Um, they often call it like a, a, a trust region method. Um, the idea is um, the update is also relatively straightforward, right? Like if you think here, this is basically all we have done here. So if you take Gauss-Newton, we brought this stuff here to the other side, then you're getting it with this one, you solve for this delta vector, and this is how you get the result. Now in Levenberg, this update is almost the same except you're adding here a regularizer. So you're saying JTJ time, uh, JTJ plus lambda times identity. So you're just adding to the diagonal here. And then you have here this delta vector equal to the gradient on the residuals on the last on the right-hand side. It's called a Tikhonov regularization. And the idea here is that this dampening factor alpha, uh, lambda is adjusted in each iteration, ensuring such that you're making progress on your update. In other words, after the update, your function energy should be lower than the previous one. Um, and if this equation is not fulfilled, just increase lambda. But it's a trust region, right? It's like, try it out. If it doesn't get better, uh, make lambda larger. Um, and if you're thinking about this, what this is practically doing, it's kind of interpolating between treating it as a Gauss-Newton with a small lambda and gradient descent with a large lambda. Right? So if this one was, if lambda here was zero, then this would be just Gauss-Newton. And if lambda here would be large, um, then 
then it would be more like a gradient descent. Um, and you can even do a little bit better than the thickener of regularization. You can even scale this not just by a diagonal. You can go ahead and scale this by the diagonal of, JT, of JTJ. Uh, and this is Lemberg mark plot. It's called LM. Um, yeah, so instead of a plane gradient descent for a large lambda, you're basically scaling each component of the gradient according to the respective curvature. Right? This is this is the diagonal, which is the square derivatives, um, JDJ. JD. Um, and this avoids slow convergence in components with small gradients. And this is it's kind of like this RMS prop idea. It's very similar, right? It's scaling it by the square um, uh, of the uh, of the gradients respectively. Um, okay. So Lemberg Marquardt also Probably out of all the Gauss Newton families, LM is the method to use for the most part. So if you're deciding to use one of these um, Hessian approximations, uh, typically LM or LBFGS, LM, LBFGS are the methods to be used. Okay, now why on earth am I telling you this? Um, I want to have a quick overview of optimization methods, generally speaking. Right? Um, if we are dealing with neural networks, our standard optimization is always going to be SGD with Adam. Like the Adam variation of SGD is our standard thing. The fallback option for the most part is SGD with momentum. The reason why I've just talked about these second order solvers is for a lot of problems in computer vision, like pulse optimization, um, intrinsic image optimization, stuff like that. All of these kind of things, they mostly rely on second order methods. And people have been, you know, breaking their heads how to get that to work for neural networks. And the one thing what people kind of figured out, the stochasticity out of all of these methods is not that great. So for gradient descent, doing SGD by taking mini batches works so remarkably well because you get good gradient approximations. Now, these approximations apparently don't hold that well for second order solvers because you need to get like some approximation of a Hessian. So it doesn't work so well for the mini batches. So as a result, the community or the results have spoken, um, meaning that practically this would be amazing to use for deep learning, but nobody has really gotten it to work. Right? So it would have been great because you have fast convergence, but it doesn't work so well in practice. Um, but why I have talked about this again, First of all, it's an open research problem, possibly still very interesting to many. Um, but if we're talking about optimization, generally speaking, I want you to have an overview to use the right solver for the right problem. Because again, machine learning is nothing else but using solvers. Deep learning specifically uses gradient descent, aka SGD. First order solvers, that's what we do. If we have linear systems, A times X is equal to B, like linear algebra, first semester probably, right? Uh, you wanna solve this, uh, you're using LU to composition, QR, Cholesky, Jacobi, Gosseidel, CG, PCG, stuff like this, right? So some of these are analytic methods, some of these are iterative methods. So Jacobi and Gosseidel um, and CG, PCG, these are iterative methods. LU, QR and Cholesky, these are matrix decomposition methods, these give you after like you decompose the matrix, right? And then you get an exact solution. Um, but these methods here, they are for linear problems. AX is equal to B, right? You can also use them for any squares problem. Uh, there are CG variations that work for linear stuff, uh, for nonlinear stuff. But for the most stuff, this is used for linear, for linear methods. I'm assuming that you know that. If you don't know these methods, I can only highly recommend look them up. This is really, really critical as a, as a machine learning expert, and I hope everybody of you will become a machine learning expert, um, you need to understand this kind of stuff, even though a lot of the stuff is now wrapped around in, in PyTorch or Python. Um, like, don't just use NumPy, understand really how these things work. Uh, it goes a little bit beyond the lecture to explain the basic optimization stuff, but it's, it's very critical. Like, I can only read every interview questions in our space, they start with, with these kind of things. For nonlinear methods, we have seen two different ones. We have seen first order and second order methods. We've seen Newton, Gauss-Newton, LM, BFGS, and so on. 
These ones, they solve nonlinear problems. For the most part, second order methods are pretty good. That's the, that's the one everybody was using for a long time, except for neural networks. That's gradient descent. Um, I also wanted to mention there's a lot of other type of optimizations. Some of them don't even use gradients to begin with. So these ones are all gradient based in one way or another one. Um, there's also genetic algorithms. There's uh, uh, MCMC, Metropolis Hastings. These are sampling based optimizers. They don't use gradients. They, I can already say, like these ones are really slow, but sometimes you can't compute gradients, right? So if you have discrete optimization methods, often you need to do something like this. They're sampling based. Um, there's also constraint based optimization, like um, there's constraint and convex solvers, right? Lagrange multipliers, ADMM, primal dual, these kind of things exist as well. Also, not so related to neural networks, uh, but these methods, they are quite quite common for, you know, if you have constraint-based optimization. So there's a lot of convex optimization classes in math. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard it. Um, they will go into much more detail here and talk about this. Um, few things, however, the reason why I went over it, I want you to remember here. Think about your problem and optimization at hand, right? And then choose the right solvers. This SGD, and from now on, we're always going to use SGD. I'm not going to repeat the other ones, but I want you to know them, that they exist. Um, SGD is specifically designed for this mini batch stuff. They're designed for neural networks. They specifically have been developed in that context. Um, when you can use a second order method, it's faster. Unfortunately for neural networks, that's not the case. Okay, last and important point. Um, I hear this all the time and somebody asks you, how do you solve a linear system? you got to know the linear solvers like LU, Cholesky, SVD, stuff like that. Gradient descent or SGD is not a way to solve a linear system. It's just not the right method for it. It's just something different. Okay, so I hope you remember that. Um, yeah, this week, um, check out the exercises, check out the office hours. Um, and in the next lecture, we're going to continue training neural networks. We're going to go and take these optimizers now. We have all the, all the recipes right now. We know how to compute gradients. We know how to use SGD to scale stuff up. We know how an architecture looks like. And now we're going to put it together. We're going to add more and more layers now. And we're going to train super cool networks. Some references to SGD updates. Um, you can look those ones up. I think this is a good reading homework over the holiday. Um, otherwise, I hope you enjoyed it. I can only reiterate it. Optimization is really important. Um, I could probably do a whole lecture around it, um, but I hope this gave you a good overview. And I'm looking forward to using this in practice and creating cool networks now. Um, with that, thanks for joining. Um, have fun. See you next week. Bye-bye.